you can close your eyes. And then you leave behind your shoes of troubles at the door. And then just be here and now. Feel your entire body. Feel your bum on your seat. Or the back, those leaning on the back against the wall. Then feel your backbone comfortably. Drop your shoulders. Your neck comfortable. And then look at the crown of your head or the top of your head. Now just breathe in. Take a long breath. And then take a long breath out. <coughs> breathe in long and breathe out long. Stay with every breath. Every breath is a new breath. Attend to each and every breath. Experience the beginning, the middle, the end of each in-breath. And each out-breath. If there's any agitation, just calm your body. Breathe in, calm.
breathe out, calm. Stay on each breath. Calming each breath. Okay, now this is not a meditation session, so we ground ourselves back to the floor, the entire body. Slowly open your eyes. Okay, now you'll be more receptive to the talk. So today's talk is about tens of uh, views. So, uh, what are views? So as long as there are uh, people uh, with different perceptions, perspectives, there will be views. So we have political views, right? So there is the democratic, there is the republican, there is the ruling one, and the, there's the opposition. So there are views. So we have currently a view that is going around Singapore, right? And that view is 377A. Correct or not? So this is a view, and everyone will have a view on that, depending on the condition of your own. And also, you have views. Everybody has views. The problem with views is that when others do not agree with your views, then you might get angry. Do you get angry if the other person don't follow your views? If you are the boss, right? or if you uh, know what you think is right to be done in society and they're not doing it, do you get angry? Do you? Yeah, so that's the taint of views. So these are mundane views. Mundane views uh, that is being a sort of everybody have. Right. Now we're going to talk about the Buddha's sort of uh, view, you know, right view. So what is the taint of views? The taint of views, it says that the taints of view or the taints, all the taints, uh, the taints, what are they? They are the taints of sense pleasures. These are taints of sense pleasures. The taints of becoming and the taint of ignorance. Ignorance of the Four Noble Truths, Becoming, and then Sense Pleasures. So, why these views? Why this taint of wrong view? Sense Pleasures, you get entangled with the world, right? We are of the five senses, we are of the sixth sense. The five senses of the eyes, the nose, the tongue, the ears, the body. And then we have our mind. So the six senses. So these sense, six senses, internally and externally, they are the world. Isn't it? Our world and the outside world. So this is, with this, we will be entangled with this world 
and that outside world. And then this becoming, this becoming is rebirth. So he tells us not to be entangled with becoming. His sole sort of teaching is to end suffering, to tell the cause. So he tells you the origin of suffering. He says, all these are suffering. All these are suffering. Because we are ignorant of the Four Noble Truths, which is suffering, the origin is craving, and then there is a cessation to that suffering by walking the Noble Eightfold Path. So this is what the Buddha emphasized. So in Singapore, very hard, right? Sense pleasures. We have a lot of sense pleasures. Our common hobby is to eat. Correct? Makan Sutra. So because we have this uh, indulging in sense pleasures, indulging in it, the sense pleasures, okay. Come move. Uh. I'm fettered to the <laughs> mic. So... Now, this world of sense pleasures uh, is the five senses. Now we have something uh, that indulges us now, right? What's this? What's this? What's this? This is a handphone. <laughs> this is our pleasure. Isn't this our pleasure? Without this, uh, there seems to be like no point living, no? Some people need the phone wherever they go, wherever they, whenever they wake up, whenever they're eating, before they sleep. So this is the sense pleasure. But you must know the danger of sense pleasures. What's the danger of these sense pleasures? There will be an addiction. An addiction is that you seem to have withdrawal when you don't have it, right? When you don't have it, you have the withdrawal symptoms. Get agitated. So then you know whether you are addicted or not if you can put it down. So this is the danger. That right now they don't talk to each other anymore. We talk to the phone all the time. We talk to an object all the time, right? So we're punching on it. There used to be a... a we used to identify a, what we call people talking to themselves as psychiatric previously. Nowadays, uh, is the norm. So here we have the dangers where we become socially isolated, not even uh, aware of our surroundings. They will be walking and talking. And so then there will be a problem that you do not know the safety of the, whether there's danger or is safe whether you are being preyed on or not, you become not uh, careful because you are overindulgent in an object. So sense pleasures, there are dangers. So you, you only use this example as sense pleasures. You must know the danger of sense pleasures. So... Only when you are, know the danger of sense pleasures that you would then move away from it. So the Buddha says sense pleasures. Now you say that, why can't I have some pleasure? Life is very stressful, but it must be the middle way. Cannot be overindulgence. So the Buddha has everything. He ate the best, he was clothed in the best, he was housed in the best. But yet he know that 
Those pleasures did not give him the answer because he saw what we will eventually be. We will eventually grow old and then be sick and die. It is the hole that we will go to eventually, every one of us. And if we do not uh, reflect on this, that life is uncertain and death is certain, then we will be entangled with the sense pleasures of the world, forgetting about the actual practice. And so because we are entangled with it, we can't break loose from it, then we will be walking surely but slowly or quickly into the hole in the road. And then when we drop, oh, I'm at my funeral already. So then it depends on what you want to do with your life. They say that the human life is very precious. It's very precious for you to learn the lesson. Otherwise, it will be again and again you come back. Repeat your studies again and again. It's like a repeat student, no? So you have to see the danger of samsara. Otherwise, you will be back in samsara again and again. And Mara, Mara, he is the CEO of Sense Pleasures. His daughter is Rati Tanha or Renraga and Thai Stu, just like the actress that come this way. You know that tempting thing? Come and then let you to the hole. And then you might not be able to get out of that hole. And the Buddha will say that sense pleasures is like a charcoal pit. It is a charcoal pit and that you would be going to the charcoal pit and that you get burnt. So you have to know the dangers of samsara. If you do not know the dangers of samsara, that you will be entangled with the sense pleasures, then it is a very strong binding cuffed, handcuffs you know, handcuffed to the samsara. So this is the danger of sense pleasures. But they say, life is good, but LG. Have you heard of LG? Life is good. <laughs> but then uh, you must be careful, must be on your guard. You must be always mindful of the Four Noble Truths. Does this cause me suffering? Another suffering? And the society suffering? So you must, every thought, speech and action, you have to be very mindful. Whether whatever you are indulging will cause you suffering, to yourself, others, both. So you have to use your discretion. So this is sense pleasures. You all can still enjoy your lunch afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but then here we talk about sense pleasures. Then we talk about becoming. So I will talk further about becoming and the understanding of karma. Now, so in the Samaditi, this is Majima Nigaya number two. Samaditi, that means we have a wrong view of this. So the Sariputta tells you what is the right view? What must we do to have the right view to remove the taint of the uh, these wrong views. 
Sama Diti, he says, if you know what, if you understand what is unwholesome, if you understand that what is unwholesome and the root of unwholesomeness and its roots, then you would not you will not go there. So you will understand that the five precepts, killing, stealing, uh, sexual misconduct, false speech, malicious speech, divisive speech, harsh speech, right? Huh? And the intoxicants or greed or hatred or conceit, all these are unwholesomeness that he mentioned. And the root of all this is loba dosa moha, which is lust, hatred, and delusion. Delusion that there is an eye enjoying all this. So this is unwholesome roots. If you understand unwholesome roots, then you will guide yourself to the wholesome. Then you will not break your precepts then you try not to be greedy or hateful or not having so much conceit. Then he says, if you just focus on these two, he says you have the right view. But he went on and on to say that each individual of the following steps can lead you to the right view. So it went on. No, this itself can lead you to the right view. Each individual part will lead you to the right view. So then he says, if you understand the Four Noble Truths, that's the right view. If you understand nutrients, that is the right view. And what is the nourishing thing that keeps us in samsara? What are the nutrients? So he says, Nutrients are food, contact, mental formation, and consciousness. This would keep you in samsara. This is what nourish you, right? People go from place to place and uh, migrate from place to place and uh, uh, seek refugee status from place to place. It's just for nourishment, just for food, just for survival. So this is nutriment. They strive to sustain themselves. So the food, we all uh, make a living uh, to eat, right? So this is, this is uh, food. So there's... Uh, you see this food, uh, if you understand food, you will understand sense pleasures. All this is part of the dependent conditionality. So we have ignorance, you have 12 dependent conditionality. Uh, then you would, because of ignorance, will give you your intention. Your intention will drive your consciousness to go to your mind body, to your six sense spaces, to your what? Contact, to your feeling, to your craving, clinging, then becoming, and then birth to a whole lot. Of suffering. So we experience the food here. Correct? So this is the tongue, the five senses, six senses, and the mind. So when we see the food, we understand sense pleasures. So now imagine your favorite food. So the favorite food. You can see it, you can smell it, you can hear it cooking, or it has a sound. When you touch it to your mouth, you put it on the, the texture or whatever, they will tell you how fine it is, whatever. 
So it has the five aggregates. Food has the five aggregates. So you can understand sense pleasures. So you can, when you understand food completely, then you understand sense pleasures. We all should be able to understand food completely, right? Because we all are food addicts, right? Makan Sutra. So, if you understand food completely, then the Buddha says you understand sense pleasures completely. And he then tells you that food has to be taken in the view. As if a couple has a child going through the desert, and then midway they get a run out of rations. And the parents discuss that instead of three of us dying, then why don't we kill the child and uh, have the food so that we can journey on? And so they did that. So they did not eat the food out of pleasure. They eat the food out of just sustenance. So the Buddha says, you should view food uh, as just a sustenance and not for pleasure. And that's how one should view food, so that one will be contented with food. And of course, there was this condition where, you, where there's dispassion even towards food. So there's a later development, so that do not sort of like be tied to sense pleasures. Then contact. If you understand contact, you understand feelings. So, if let's say, we, I, I now ask you, what is your feelings when you think of your job? Is it pleasant? Who say pleasant? <laughs> Very few only, right? Most of them say unpleasant or neutral. Now I talk about, uh, now contact your family. Pleasant or unpleasant? Huh? It depends whether you have a quarrel or not, right? <laughs> okay, uh, so that is contact. So each contact, uh, so this is only the sixth sense based contact. If you understand contact, you understand feelings. And then contact is impermanent, right? When I give you a contact, depending on the conditions, uh, you may have pleasant feeling. At other time, it's unpleasant feelings. You love food, right? You go to that particular store, you expect this particular taste, but after that, they change the cook. Then the taste and everything change. So then, your perception may change too. So contact is impermanent. How can feelings be permanent? But the problem is that we cling to feelings and we cling to perceptions. And so that is the, the problem. So if you understand contact, you will understand feelings. Mental formations. Mental formations is here. So volitional formations are either by body, bodily formations, verbal formations, and then you have mental formations. So, when we say that uh, you contact something, you are form. So, now I say, um, durian, what is your mental formation? So, you have a feeling, depending on whether you are pro or against durian, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, then you might have the perception. Some perception is that now durians all got poisoned right, by insecticide. Yeah? No, I don't want to eat it. Yeah? So it depends on your mental formations. And in your mental formations, uh, you will have certain effects on the body. When you are upset, the body has a certain sensations. So that's why there's formations. If your formations are strong, then it becomes your identity. This is my view. 
Then you have bodily formations and verbal formations. If you are angry, do you, have, do you feel something in your body? In your chest, in your head, in your eyes? It forms your body. Mental formations also. So there is a mind-body relation because of the consciousness, the volition that drives the consciousness to produce these sensations. So if you are stressed daily, daily you are irritated or triggered by a particular person or incident uh, and you cannot get out of it, so it continues to repeatedly contact. So it is a feedback loop. This contact, this feeling. So this consciousness of stress will then go into the mind-body to produce that body of suffering. So you have like ulcer, gastric ulcer. Each person has their own uh, stress signature. Their stress signature. So when you are stressed, now if I tell you you're going to be like, imagine you're going to be late for work. What, uh, work or uh, late for an appointment, a very important appointment. So how do you feel? in your body. You might have palpitations. You might start breathing faster. Then you tell a driver, hey, go faster, or something like that. Huh? Or you think of ways to like, beat the traffic, like going up the curb. <laughs> you know, I heard about the man who wants to get to his son on time. He quickly go up the curb. So there are, these are volitions that drives. So if you understand volitions, because the volitions, there is intention. If you understand volition, you understand craving. Because every volition is about craving, right? Whether you want something or not. Whether you don't want something or not. Whether you want this thing uh, the, to continue. So there is Kama Tanha, Bhava Tanha, and Vibhava Tanha. So if you understand your intentions, uh, you understand your own cravings. So there is volition. Then consciousness, we all have said already, if you have certain consciousness, you're very stressed, you know your own stress signature, it will produce that mind body it will descend into that part of your body to produce the body and the mind. The mind of, the, of that consciousness will descend to the body to produce it. So this is one of the suggested factors. And the Chinese physicians of 5,000 years have noticed that when a person is depressed, they commonly get a lung problems. And if they are constantly agitated and angry, they get liver cancer. And if they are worrier, they get spleen problem or marrow problems. Spleen is of the immune system. So, if, so they have noticed that certain repetitive consciousness will descend into the body to produce. And so people with tumors, so the body, no tumors, they are stressed. Every time, no, they have this pain in the gastric, pain in the stomach. And then they continue to stress it, repeatedly stressing it, because they can't get out of the situation. They can't let go. They don't know that the, they're ignorant of their suffering. They just carry on, carry on in that way. So this produces this Consciousness, mental formations produce the, the volition produces the consciousness and the consciousness produces the mind-body. So the four nutrients can be understood. Food, as sense pleasures, contact, understand feeling, mental formations, understand consciousness, consciousness understands the mind-body. So this is the 12th 
are sort of part of the 12 DO, dependent conditionality. So if you understand your treatments, uh, he says it's enough to get this entangled with the views. This is one of them. Then he went on to say, if you understand uh, OH, sickness, he says you must understand all this, you must understand the origin, the cessation. He says, if you understand the origin of OH and sickness, and what's the origin of OH and sickness? We have OH and sickness because we are born. So there's birth. Right, yeah? So if you understand that, that there is birth, then you have OH, then you don't want to be born again into samsara. So this is, you understand OH and sickness, then, and that birth is the cause, then you do not want to be, you take rebirth in any of the realms, because any of the realms are impermanent. And any of the realms, so this we have this human realm where we can uh, understand suffering. Since the human realm is the uh, best realm to be in because we see suffering. And because we see suffering, we want to have it ended. And so he says if you are take rebirth in the higher realms, then it's like in the deva realms or in those with very, very much resources, if they have a lot of resources, they don't know what the poor feels like. Right, huh? So it's the same. So you think about it. If you know the origin of old age and sickness, then the origin is birth. And the, what is the origin of birth is becoming. So he went on to say this, uh, each step by itself. The origin of birth because there's a becoming. And the origin of becoming is there's clinging, clinging, uh, and then craving, feeling, contact, etc., etc. Then it goes back to ignorance. And the condition of ignorance is taints. These taints fit it. The taint of sense pleasure fit the ignorance. The taint of becoming, the view of becoming, fit ignorance. And so, the ignorance fit ignorance. So then, it carries on that way. So in that particular sutta, it tells the Buddha, uh, and uh, this is Sariputta, Sariputta says that if you look at just one point, you can have the right view and the understanding, understanding to get out of the wrong view. And then, the other monks ask him, what are other ways? So he went step by step and by step. So he went, this, if you understand unwholesome roots completely, unwholesome actions and their roots completely, then you get rid of ignorance. And similarly, wholesome roots and that then the roots of a loba, a dosa, a moha. Then you understand. And then slowly, slowly, so there are many, many steps. So he says, if you understand any one of those steps, you can get Sama Diti, right view. <laughs> Is it too heavy? Too heavy. Okay, then questions. <laughs> Anything you want to ask? Because this is only one sutta that I'm talk about. If this one you cannot take it, uh, can take this? Can I understand roughly? Any question? Yes. Uh, thank you for a very. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for a very, very detailed uh, explanations on uh, starting from the what you call the uh, the, the the sensations and then uh, on the detail how it becomes triggered as a, a rebirth in terms of. Uh, the process itself. Just wondering, for example, if like in a layman term, for example, people are having six senses, people attracted to good food, uh, 
want to hear a good music, want to see a beautiful things. Once it is triggered, then it becomes like we, we want to have this. We want to, uh, it, it becomes a craving for us. But if we understood uh, partially, for example, then we, we don't become, uh, we, we don't become attached, we don't cling into it. Does it help uh, in terms mm -hmm. of our practice? For example, we still have the craving, for example, we, we can't help because we have the sixth sense. But in, in some ways, we, we, we can cut the, the clinging into those things. Will it help, for example? Thank you. Yes. So he will teach you how to uh, reduce the craving. So this would be my next sutta, to reduce the craving. If you have, do you have any more questions? Any more questions? So he talked about this. Uh, then he went on to the another sutta. This is Samaditi Sutta. So Samaditi says that if you practice the right view, you can end the suffering. So these are quite detailed on how to end suffering. On what, what is the right view and how to have the proper understanding of each section. Then in the sutta that I'm going to share now, it's called Sabha Asava. That means all the things. And this is the second sutta in Majima Nigaya. This is, uh, oh, this is number nine. Number nine sutta. The second sutta is called uh, Sabasava. That means all the things. All the things. And he says how to get rid of all the things. He says by Yoniso Manasikara. That means you must pay proper attention to the essentials. So then he teach us how to pay proper attention. So you have this acronym called Sir Read. You must read this properly. You all know about Sir Charge, right? <laughs> Over and above. Okay, over and above your charges. So now you must read this uh, over and above. So how to do that? So you must see. First you must see. See that this is suffering. See that, you know, this is like, this is causing you suffering. It must be practical to you that when you feel agitated, you are suffering. You must see for yourself that this is suffering and that is, there's this self you think that there's this self that is suffering. So you have to just know that this is just processes and conditions. Just now we all see the 12 dependent conditionality. It's just processes and that the training is not there. That's why one suffers. So if you train yourself to see, then the suffering reduces. So you must see. Then the second is you must use you must use things uh, properly, contentedly. You just use things, the food, the clothes, the appar your handbag or whatever. You don't need to have branded things. You use your lodgings. You don't need to stay in the seas, you know. And then you just stay contented. You just use the things within your means. Then you will be uh, not stress and then restrain you have to restrain yourself if you know how to restrain yourself from doing things that are unwholesome from speaking things that may cause hurt you know you restrain bite your tongue, don't say or whatever so here is your restraint you must practice restraint to avoid unwholesomeness coming up. And then you must remove. If you have bad habits, you must remove them. If you need to, uh, you have to like make a great effort to remove or abandon. Then you must endure physically or words that are not welcoming. 
right? Conditions that are not welcome, just endure it for the time being. And then this arise and cease. And then you avoid going to dangerous places or wild animals or evil friends. So you must avoid. And then you have to develop the seven factors of enlightenment, starting with mindfulness. And then you must investigate. And you have the energy to do it. The energy and then you develop your tranquility of your body, your mind, and then the equanimity. So this is how. So you say how, right? So this is the how, he says it. How? You must see. You must stop and watch what's happening. You must be objective. Use, restrain, remove, endure, avoid, and then develop. So this is one whole sutta. And this is a read you must try to do. So there are many methods. And this is, all this may have to come to your, these are your tools that you have to use. Any questions? Before I go to the next sutta. <laughs> Yes. Ah, yes. So in the sutta, it says, uh, so in the time of the Buddha, he says, avoid elephants, wild elephants. Avoid wild dogs. A lot, avoid wild cows. I think they all have cows that roam around and then, you know, or snakes. He says, avoid all this. So avoid the animals. And then he says, avoid cispids. You know, they, in India, they sort of like poo and pee, you know. They may have not much latrines or toilets, even now, right? So you have a new show, right? The, the woman says, I only marry you if you have a toilet in the house. <laughs> have you heard of that one? Yeah. So you see, they, they say that avoid those places. So you might just walk into a cispid. You don't go out in the night because you might just walk into a cow lying there. So he tells the monks, don't go out at night for elms. So you avoid, so there may be, so you can actually, you know, uh, project. Don't go out in the night where there may be more uh, unsavory characters around. You know, and then you don't, you want to avoid certain places that you get into trouble with, if, right? So then the most important, he says, avoid evil friends. Avoid evil people. Right, huh? So this is, you, if you avoid evil, because sometimes uh, people do things in a pack. You know, people say, encourage, you know, just, they do something, uh, you know, they, oh, just do this, and then unmindfully, they just follow the crowd, follow the pack. So you want to avoid people who are unwholesome. So this avoiding. No more questions? So this is, this, is, uh, this is what, you can always go to this sutta and look. Then we have another sutta called uh, Majjhima Nikaya 60, Apanyaka. This they call incontrovertible, but the Venerable Sujuta uh, translate it is guaranteed. Uh, this is uh, Apanyaka, Apanyaka Sutta. So in this Sutta, he tells you of the danger of wrong views. And he, at that time, in the time of Buddha, there were a lot of wrong views. And what are the wrong views? So he says, nihilism. So they, some people believe, you know, that uh, after this life, there is no more other lives. Just eat, drink, and be merry for, you know, there is no tomorrow. There's no afterlife. There's no spontaneous birth. There's no afterbirth. 
afterlife, I mean. <laughs> there's after, uh, okay, there is no afterlife. So there's nihilism, where the physical goal, that means earth to earth, you know, there's the heat dissipate, that's the end. So that's what they believe. And because they believe in it, then they don't uh, practice good karma. They don't practice good actions. So there's nihilism. And then there's uh, those, another uh, is non-action. That means the action, so this is all about karma, right? So non-action is that good or bad actions, really non-action, nah. no uh, results. They have no results. So people who do not think that their actions bring uh, bad results will then do those actions. So you have people who commit the actions uh, in ignorance. So because they have this view. Then they have the they have said non causality. Non causality. Or that there is no cause, no condition for this happening. There's no cause for evil and no cause for uh wholesomeness. So they believe that everything is predicted. You don't have to, uh, it's all set up, it's all fated. There's no cause or reason for this happening because everything is predicted. It is all fated. So when they believe in everything is fated, then they won't exert an effort to overcome their problems because it's fated. Ma. So then there is this non-causality. Then they believe in non-immaterial realms or they don't believe in the heavens. So we all have this material, right? This body, you know? And then they don't believe that there is an immaterial realms. So they don't believe that there is heavens or that there is a realm where there is no body. So when they don't believe, they don't practice the way to even the heavens, right? So they don't believe. So the other one is, they don't believe that there is a non-cessation of being. So when you don't believe that there is non-cessation of being, of becoming, then this one cannot stop. It cannot stop. There will be samsara again and again. If you have that view that there will be non-cessation, that means there's a continuation of this being, which is something that you see, you feel, you experience your good and bad results. It will stay on forever and ever. Then you would not practice if you have this view. If you have this view, then there is the second thing of becoming. You want to be reborn in the world of a particular world. For example, you no know, certain worlds that you want to go to, certain uh, heavenly realms that you want to go to. So you don't believe in the cessation of the being. Then there will be a continuation in samsara. So then you won't practice to the end of the being. So you won't practice to see the cessation of being. But you would actually know that there's a cessation, right? There's a cessation of your, your uh, breath. right? Huh? Even the breathing in and the breathing out, there is the breathing in will stop to have the breathing out. For your feelings, uh, your feelings change. Your happy feelings have changed to, you know, maybe unpleasant feelings. Your happy feelings have fallen. Your unhappy feelings have also fallen. So, your feelings cease. So, body, you know, bodily uh, function cease. And that uh, uh, feeling cease. The mind states of anger also cease. Arise and cease, arise and cease depending on conditions. It's just the mindfulness 
and the wisdom not enough. That's why there's arising and again and again. But you know that those mind states can cease. So it ceases. So you have the mental formations also. You know, mind states, mental formation arise and cease. And also the consciousness also arise and cease. So in all the steps of the 12 dependent conditionality, all each and every step can cease. Can cease in then there it cease when there's no ignorance it cease. So it so it uh, uh, every step can cease. So for those people, now we all many adults here. Remember the time when you indulge in toys? Do you have any indulgence in toys? That has ceased already, right? <laughs> or has it happened? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it has ceased, right? Oh, okay. Nowadays they have Hello Kitty, or it doesn't cease, right? <laughs> so they built upon it, built and built into an industry to have a virtual toys. But we have left those toys behind, right? Have certain toys and certain likes that you have, they have ceased. You don't go back there again. You have certain bad habits you have ended. There are certain uh, things that you, uh, like smoking, you know, like smoking have stopped already. Or alcohol, you may stop because they are bad for health. Previously, you may pick up from, you know, peer pressure, etc. But you have let it go. So it ceases. Becoming cis. So it is possible that there is cessation. Because is you can see that the five aggregates cease. And because you see the five aggregates cease, then you can see that the four noble truths is true. The suffering can cease. It's just arising and ceasing. Because it's the conditions of the world. It arises, there's an origin, and then you abandon it, then you will realize its cessation. So then there is the ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. You have to like go around and round and round it to see yeah, for yourself and put in the effort to remove the unwholesomeness. And every time it comes up, it's just uh, the faculties not enough, the 37 factors of enlightenment not enough. You just have to practice again and again and again. Because then we can see that this is all just processes. Just processes that one leads to the other. But this also brings to the other part where they have this suffering, but there's also there's conditional uh, where it will have relief or the release. Because with your faith, you practice, you see things as they are, and when you see things as they are, then you get this passion with your toys uh, and of your becoming, of your wanting, then you let them go. You let them go, then you know that you have let them go, that your consciousness turn away from those of the world and of the next world of becoming, sense, pleasures, and of becoming, then there is a cessation. So then he says, then your taints, uh, then it becomes tainless, you see, unclinging. So this is the, uh, another sutta. <laughs> this is the Buddha's words in the suttas. I'm just repeating them. Huh? So it's just that, this you have to be reminded of. So there is karma, there is karma. And if there is a wrong view, you feel that this doesn't, if you believe in this, then this wrong view, you will have wrong intention. A wrong intention, you have wrong speech. Then it will lead you to the wrong path. Okay, so then you will not be released. So this is the... Uh, 
if you, you understand that there is karma, there is causes and conditions, and that it will have consequences to your actions of your mental, your speech, and your bodily actions, then you would exert yourself and you will strive to prevent the arising of unwholesomeness and abandoning the unwholesomeness. And then you want to maintain your good habits and you want to not have a rising of good habits. So it is all this getting rid of your bad habits, getting rid of so-called uh, defilements or unwholesomeness and it's that arise in your mind because only you are aware of what went in the mind. So this is about karma. So only the person, uh, so there is rebirth. As long as there is a conditioner, as long as there is uh, ignorance, and there is craving, then the rebirth will take place. So there is karma. Only for the Arya, where there is no Arahan, where there is no more craving and no more ignorance, then there is no more rebirth in any realm. So there is rebirth in the conditional realm. Basing when there is ignorance and craving, there will be a becoming. Only for those enlightened, then there will be no becoming for the Arahants. So, if people tell you uh, there is no afterlife, you must think very carefully because in the suttas, it's very, very clear. You want to hear any more story? <laughs> you want to hear any more sutta? Since there's 15 minutes left. So there is a uh, Dika Nikaya number one. Number one. Nah. And this is called uh, Brahma Jala Sutta. That means the net of views. The net of views. At the time of the Buddha, there were 62 views. All about just now, no? All about these views. So there is like eternal view, eternalism, nihilism, etc., etc. A lot of views. As long as there are many people in this hall, there are so many views. And then the Buddha says, why? Why these views exist? That is because of clinging. When you cling to something, then that view becomes strong. Why we have a net of views? If we cling on to our views, we don't let go, then that views become you. You will do it again and again. Why is Islam so strong? Because they pray five times a day. Do you pray? Nah? And sometimes never read suttas even. <laughs> I mean the teachings of the Buddha. You know the teachings of the Buddha are encapsulated in the suttas. 17,000 over sutras for you to read. You know, they read again and again, five times a day. So their faith will be very strong. So if, you, if that's why the Buddha asks you to have perception, that means you must perceive impermanence, that these are impermanent. So you have this reflection of impermanence, in perception of impermanence, moment to moment. Your breath is impermanent. Material things are impermanent. Feelings are impermanent. Mental formations are impermanent. The five aggregates are impermanent. So this would be for your happiness. So he asks you to perceive that moment to moment. Perception of impermanence, perception of non-self. Right? Perception of defilements. What are my defilements? So you must perceive it moment to moment. So this is... Uh, Brahma Jala, the net of views. Then I'll tell you another one called Dika Naka Sutta. Since I have time, I'll spend it until I 
have. <laughs> and you all are quiet. So dika naka means long nails. So this person has long nails. So he's a wandering ascetic. Then he come to the Buddha and then he paid respects. And after paying respects, he says, I, uh, nothing is acceptable to me. Then Buddha says, isn't nothing is acceptable to you? It's also a view. Then he says, but nothing is acceptable to you is better. Then everything is acceptable to you. Is everything acceptable? When everything is acceptable to you, then lust is acceptable to you. Dosa is acceptable to you. You are closer to loba and dosa if everything is acceptable to you. Then there are some people who say that something is acceptable to me and something is not acceptable to me. But then when there's something is acceptable to you, it's still closer to lust and hatred. But when you say nothing is acceptable to me, then the Buddha says that it is closer to non-lust and non-hatred. Then Dika Naka, the ascetic, says, Oh, the Buddha commends me, you know, praises me, that I am closer to Nibbana. Now, then the Buddha went on to say, The body is made up of elements only. Your calcium, your magnesium, your whatever. You all take your calcium and all that. Yeah. So you make up of all these minerals of earth, water, heat, and air, the lungs and the flatus that you passed. You are only of these elements and occupy a certain space. One, uh, four feet ten, you occupy a certain space only. And then you have a consciousness. These are your elements, he says. And then you have feelings. When you have a feelings, you have feelings that are either pleasant at one time only, or unpleasant at one time only, or neutral at one time only. And here it says your body, you have feelings. These feelings are impermanent. And that uh, it all depends on the body, right? You have feelings because you have this body to feel. And this, he says, are impermanent. And because they are impermanent, uh, they are non-substantial. And that you can let that go. And here, when Sariputta listening to the Buddha giving this discourse to Actually, his nephew, Dika Naka, the Sariputta realized. He says that the Buddha knows it as it is happening. That means he knows feelings thoroughly. And he also sees that feelings arise and cease and of, no, of no substance. And then that's how Sariputta realized. Sariputta realized arahanship on comprehension of feelings. And this is this is what the sutta is about. So you can see that the Buddha says, I don't quarrel with others' overviews. Because views are mental formations. Ma. Everybody has views based on the conditioning and based on their ignorance. So if we quarrel over views, then he says uh, that will be actually uh, not practicing his teaching because of the quarrel. When a person has a view, that's his entitlement. Entitlement to his view, depending on the dust in his eyes. We all have dust in our eyes. We have certain condition. So he's entitled to that view until that dust is clear off. So the Buddha says he never quarrel with another over views. So we try not to quarrel with others' overviews. That makes life more peaceful. <laughs> okay, any more questions? No questions, sir. Uh? Uh, <clears throat> I try to simplified it's very deep your teaching but very impressive S mm, speak okay. about the meditation in mm. buddhism we do meditation right. and of course this will cultivate our we call it awareness right yeah? but <clears throat> my question is 
we also have to pray, maybe not five times a day, but when we pray or chanting, yeah? yes. how this work to cultivate our awareness or our perception? I'm talking about good perception. Yeah? Okay. Chanting uh, requires you to apply your mind on the words that you're going to chant. So that is, you have to apply mindfulness to your speech that you're going to come out. So by doing that, you are away from unwholesome things. The chanting is wholesome in that sense. It's not about any killing, stealing, whatever. None of all those things. So it's a wholesome act. So chanting itself is a wholesome act. That is, uh, then after that, if you understand the contents of the chant, if you understand the contents, that means what the chant means. If some people chant without knowing the meaning, it's just giving service or parroting. But even then, even then, uh, because they are away from the unwholesomeness or the defilements, it gives them a certain peace of mind because they are turned away from the unwholesomeness. So that's the power of the chant. Then, further power to the chant is there is a meaning to the chant. Okay, yeah? And then if there is a, if you understand the meaning, then there is a, a increased power of the chant. Right? So if, you dip, so if there is this chant, if you have very strong faith that this chant will heal you if, there's a, if there is this faith, this confidence, then that's how the chant has a power. Right? Then if you have this uh, knowing uh, that this chant, exactly what it says, so if you say uh, the words that it uh, says, be well, and then you fill yourself with wellness, so there's a power of the chant. Be happy. And then you'll be happy. That's the power of the chant. So it depends on the, uh, the, the strength of the cultivator. So, the, for example, the Bojanga Sutta. The Bojanga Sutta, if you just chant the Bojanga Sutta without understanding, then it will be just the faith. You just go through the ritual of just the chanting and the words. But then if you understand the Bojanga Sutta, or the practitioner understand the uh, Bojanga Sutta, for example, the Bojanga Sutta is about the seven factors of enlightenment. So you recall, so the Buddha asked uh, Venerable Chunda to chant when he was unwell, to chant the seven, Bojang seven factors of enlightenment. And and Maha Moggallana and Maha Kasapa, when they were unwell, had the uh, Bojanga. So when they chant the Bojanga, they, then the perception and the practice comes back on the seven factors of enlightenment, on mindfulness, on investigation, on energy. So it just, they have gone through that already. So they, they perceive it again. And then it recur in them again. So those factors have their power in the, in the healing process because the mind and the body, the mind and the body then goes through mindfulness of the body, the feelings, the mental for the, the mind and then the Dharma. Then it also goes through the investigation. This body is just arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing. So as they go there, as they do it, as they go through each factor, they also practice the factors and they actually just watch them. Then the energy comes up. The rapture of the physical body, then the mind and the joy and the concentration and then the equanimity. So it leads them through all those. So that is the power of the Bojanga Suttas. That's how the, the healing. It is actually the power goes through 
the power of the practice. So in those suttas uh, whereby the Mahakasapa, Venerable Moga, Maha Moggallana, the Buddha, you know, as they go through the Bhujanga suttas, then the healing process comes in. So they say they recover after the, uh, the chants. And why do you need the, uh, somebody to chant? Just a reminder, just to remind, and then you just go through that process of that. Only if the person understands. And we also have done like scientific studies uh, that those people who chant, 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 and then you drink the water, it seems to have some uh, effect on, the, or on themselves or plants. So they were saying that the power of the chants. So there it was a, a researcher in mindfulness and the concentration practice. And they say that if you just keep on repeating a word, it itself has a power. So if you just say peace, peace, peace. So if you just keep peace, peace, or any word. So they sometimes say Amitabha, Amitofo. No, they keep on repeating the word. Uh, and if that word, the deity, uh, has a meaning to them, then that deity has that sort of power. So they have this sort of healing. You know, it's their, the perception. So it goes on perception. So this is the power of chanting. By being focused, concentrated, then being focused and concentrated on the wholesome things has its healing and powerful effect. And then how it has further, so the mind then uh, here, and the mind can then hear by the wisdom, which is the Bojanga sutras. So they know it, everything arising, ceasing, arising, ceasing. You know? So this is the wisdom. You know? So the chance is just a chant, but it depends on the, the development of that individual. This is not the topic, right? <laughs> this is a sidetrack. <laughs> All right. Just having to say that just now, the last sentence is maybe I have a question. Referring to the, you call it chanting, yeah? there's a sound. Yes. To me, I mean, to many people, <coughs> chanting is a sound. Yes. It's, some of our chanting have some translation. Yes. Then we're able. To get the understanding, right? Or maybe we are able also to visualize. Mm. Uh, I'm using this visualize because uh, Vajrayana using this power of the vibration. Eh? So my question, since you mentioned just now, should we during the chanting uh, try to get the right understanding, not just only hearing the right understanding of the chanting, to be able to visualize? Or we able to cultivate our feeling because mm. the word is a sound. Yes. So if the sound, then the Buddha always emphasizes of impermanence. So you hear the sound like my voice is impermanent, is changed. The words is impermanent, is changed. Arise and cease. Arise and cease. So he emphasizes on perception of impermanence. So this is of the Dharma, it fades away, it ceases, it stops. There's nothing to the sound, just a sound. So they say, sticks and bones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. So it is no sometimes uh, sound, no some harsh sound. So these are just sounds. And then of course there are healing sounds. So we have music therapy. Music therapy where you use the vibrations of the sounds, you know, like you say Tibetan, use a drum, um, or um, you know, it vibrates. So you, there's this physical part of us that is also rising and falling and vibrating. So it just sort of like sing. So your body just sing with that vibrations. And then when you feel good, your mind feels good. You know, so this is the, the, uh, the step whereby they use therapy to hear. So you, your mind is away from those unwholesomeness or your pains, and then you direct them to the sounds. But the Buddha says the sound 
that we want to direct is to see and hear the sound as a hearing object. And all hearing objects are impermanent. That is what the Buddha wants us to see or to hear, that the sound is impermanent. So we have a Heart Sutra, Guan Si Ying Pusa. And he says, Se si hong ma, hong si se. So xiang xing se. The five aggregates are empty. And because they are empty, there is no suffering. So this is, this is what to say, to just link the sound, paying yoniso manasikara, means you want to pay attention to the sound as impermanent, to all the sense objects in the world as impermanent. What you see, what you smell, what you taste, what is touched, what you hear, what you think are all impermanent. And they have no substance. So then we don't engage to them. And if you don't engage, you let them go. So there is no becoming, you don't land on them anymore. Ding, I think I heard something. <laughs> Means the end of the session. So the cessation of the session today. <laughs> now where's the gentleman? Ah, in waiting, yeah. Okay, going to end the. Any more questions? Yes. Hello. I would Hi. like to ask about uh, our attitude or approach towards food. La. <laughs> More mundane question. So, right. um, like oh, he mentioned, of course, uh, we should treat food like um, the, right, the right attitude is like, uh, it's like sustenance, right? Eat right, to, right. just to leave, you know, not to cr um, crave for, oh, this is delicious, I want to eat it and things like that. But sometimes it's like food is a very big thing in our life, right? Every day we have to eat also, mm. we eat lunch or dinner, breakfast and things like that. Then at lunchtime, you say, oh, I feel like eating uh, something, maybe mm. laksa. It's, it's very simple. It's just downstairs or something. Right, right. You have this feeling you want to eat that. Right, right. So, I mean, like, uh, there's also uh, dangers in gratification and things like that. But how would you uh, suggest or uh, advise how we, uh, our attitude towards food then? Like, oh, I feel like eating uh, laksa then, you know, at, at, for lunch. Right, then right. you will want to go and buy, queue and buy it and yeah, yeah for that ma. Yeah. yeah. Then that is satisfying your craving. Okay. Yeah. So uh if you have to, so if you have to queue very long. <laughs> yeah. So if you just have to queue, get your food, nah, then you mindfully eat your food. Then when you mindfully eat your food, you feel nourished by your food. Then you have the energy to continue your work. Mm. So it's actually mindfulness in uh, the whole process. So you want to do it mindfully. That uh, whatever you eat, uh, uh, that uh, it is uh, no, wholesome and you nourish you. So I think that's the attitude that you uh, no, put to it. So those is not overindulgence. It's not overindulgence because we have to be nourished. Yeah, there is a, a choice of convenience sometimes, right here. Huh? And then, uh, then, for example, uh, this is this is like being perplexed now. Like now, uh, it's like, hey, what, how, what attitude? Uh? So the attitude is just when there's food uh, and it's available, then eat it, uh. You know, it's not like you have to plan your menu or whatever. You no, know? it's like you don't have to spend so much time, space, uh, to sort of like work on it, you know? So you just, there is, then you go there, then you just take the food. Nah. Yeah. It's just an easy thing. Nah. You just don't need to be, you know, too uh, affected by this uh, food thing unless, you know, like uh, there is some particular food that you uh, need to, like, you need, 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 you know, you want, want, want. Nah. Then you also notice, lo when you uh, desire that food, uh, and that food may not be too healthy for you, uh, then you must breathe, stop, 
see your craving, then you, you may reduce that craving for that particular food. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think I think uh, let's say three sadhus for Dr. Up. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.